Well, hey there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Tuesday, August 23rd. And tonight we're talking about some big primary elections. The polls are all closed in Florida and Oklahoma. Florida's Democrats are picking a challenger to take on Governor Ron DeSantis. And in New York, two incumbent Democrats in the U.S. House are running for the same seat. We'll have the latest projections and analysis. We're learning more about the classified documents recovered from Mar-a-Lago. How will this affect the Justice Department's investigation? Also, Twitter's former head of security turns whistleblower. He claims the company's carelessness threatens national security. We'll break down his accusations and Twitter's response. And a new advanced placement class will let high schoolers earn college credit for African American studies. A teacher in this pilot program joins us live. I love these primary Tuesdays. We love them around here. And another primary election day is wrapping up, this time in my home state of Florida, New York, and Oklahoma. Let's begin in Florida with the Democratic primary for governor. NBC News can confidently project that former Governor Charlie Crist will win this primary. You may remember Charlie Crist was already governor once, but as a Republican. He is running against a number of candidates, including the state's current Commissioner of Agriculture and Consumer Services, Nikki Freed. The party's nominee, of course, is going to challenge Republican Governor Ron DeSantis this November. Governor DeSantis ran unopposed in his primary. And again, we are projecting this race for former Republican Governor Charlie Crist, running again, this time as a Democrat. In Oklahoma, there is a runoff for the seat of retiring Republican Senator James Inhofe. The Democratic primary, we're characterizing that right now as too early to call. We're still waiting for more results to come in. And also, on the Republican side, that race is also too early to call. That's a special election between Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen and T.W. Shannon, who was the former Oklahoma State House Speaker. Both running for that race, Mark Wayne Mullen is endorsed by former President Trump. Here in New York, the polls close at the top of the hour. There are a number of important races here. One of the biggest is between two powerful House Democrats who are vying for a newly merged district. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Gerald Nadler is up against House Oversight Committee Chairwoman Carolyn Maloney. They're facing off in the redrawn 12th District. Both were first elected to the House in 1992. Plenty to discuss tonight, and joining us to start off are NBC senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen and NBC Shaquille Brewster, who is live in my old stomping grounds in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Shaq, let me start with you. We've just called the race for Charlie Crist for the Democratic nomination for governor. What have voters been talking to you about today? You know, it's so interesting because over the course of the day, I've been talking to voters as they've been going into the polls, and they've been saying to me that what they were viewing as they were making this decision on who they would support to go up against Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, it mirrored very closely what you heard from the candidates as they were making their pitches to voters. They were saying their top priority is defeating this Republican voter, uh, uh, governor, and I'm talking about Democratic voters here, and you see that margin that you uh, have and that you just announced. It's about 300,000 vote margin. That's not what we expected. We know that Charlie Chris came into this race ahead in the polls. He secured some major endorsements among Democratic Party officials here in Florida, from union officials here in Florida, and was able to ride that momentum into the general election. And I want you to listen to that pitch that we heard from Charlie Chris. He was saying that, yes, I may have been a former Republican governor, but I'm someone who can win over independents, who can win over Republicans in this crucial state and go head-to-head -head when facing DeSantis. That was his pitch. Listen to what we heard from voters as they were walking out of the voting booth today. I was remembering uh, Charlie Crist. Okay, he was uh, okay. I know him. So I said, you know what, that's where I'm going again. So you went with Crist because he was familiar to you? Yes. Right. Yeah. I just don't think Crist was that, not really that person. And they, since the Democratic, the Dolphins said, Freed, I went along with that. 
That was a couple, one of the first groups or one of the first two voters I spoke to. One person went with Freed, the other went with Chris. But you get a sense that that was the messaging that they heard. Nikki Freed, who is not winning this race, she was saying that she was providing and offering voters something new. She said that the issue of abortion fundamentally changed not just how we look at Florida for the general election, but looked at how we should look at it for the primary race. You see the margin there. That is not the case where it's going to be Charlie Chris taking on Ron DeSantis in November. One more projection I should note. Uh, in the race for U.S. Senate, the Democratic primary, NBC News can project that Florida Congresswoman Val Demings will walk away with that nomination. Val Demings is a very well-known congresswoman from Central Florida. Her husband, Jerry Demings, is the mayor of Orange County, and you may remember her from some of the House impeachment hearings. So we're also projecting that Val Demings will win her primary as well by a very, very strong margin in the race for U.S. Senate. Shaq, let me just stick with you for one second, and then John Allen, I'll come back to you. What have the candidates been saying? Nikki Fried and Charlie Crist, what were their sales pitches? What were their talking points ahead of this election day? It really was what you heard from those voters. It was the idea that the focus for Democrats in the state of Florida needs to be DeSantis. To be clear, you have voters and candidates talking about plenty of issues as the pre-programming is starting behind me. They talked about abortion. They talked about education in a state where the criticism from Democrats is that there was too much involvement from the governor on the curriculum at a local level. They talked about things like inflation and the increase in the price of rent, for example. But for Democrats in this primary battle they viewed it and the candidates were selling it to them as a battle to see who's the strongest to go up against the Santas. Listen to a little bit of that closing message as we now know the winner of this result. I have been in those trenches for three and a half years as our only statewide elected Democrat. Democrats are looking for a winner. Um, the only one who's been able to win our state is a Democrat. They're looking for a champion. I've been the governor. I've been the attorney general and fought for civil rights. I've been the elected commissioner of education and fought for our teachers. That's the difference. Electability and experience. I offer both and a good heart. That's what Florida needs and deserves. You know, one interesting thing with that last part that you heard, electability and experience. Electability is a loaded term. We can talk to our colleague Ali Vitali about that, and that is something that we've been watching closely. And I think we have Nikki Fried behind me right now, so we'll see uh, what she has to say. All right, Shaq, you know what? I'm going to let you go and listen to Nikki Fried. John Allen, let me come to you with regard to the races here in New York, particularly this 12th congressional district that got redrawn, that pits Carolyn Maloney against Gerald Nadler, two very powerful Democrats in the U.S. House. What are we expecting from that race? It's a great question, Joshua. I'm in New York, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this, but uh, probably the place where it's best to look at uh, the uh, damage that redistricting can do to one party. In this case, you've got Carolyn Maloney and Gerald Nadler running against each other, two committee chairmen. Nadler, the Judiciary Committee chairman, uh, folks may remember him from the impeachment of Donald Trump uh, as, uh, as chairman of the committee during that. Uh, Carolyn Maloney, ch uh, chairman of the House Oversight Committee. They've both been in Congress since I was in high school. Um, <laughs> Nadler coming in late 1992, Maloney in early 93. They're, they've been allies in the past, but this has been a pretty nasty race. And because there aren't very many differences them, uh, between them on policy, it's been very personal. Uh, Nadler has, seems to have uh, gotten a lot of the backing of the uh, progressive establishment, and I think it would be a shock if Maloney were to win or somehow uh, Suraj Patel, the third candidate in the race, did. We're going to talk about this a little bit more with our guests coming up, but it seems like in New York there are a couple of races that are being looked at as bellwethers, right, to try to get the, the temperature of the, of the country. What is your sense of how much we should read into some of those bellwether races? Is it about abortion? Is it about inflation? Is it about this? Is it about that? What, what are we actually expecting to learn from the results of tonight's races in New York? Such a great question. Um, I, I liken it to a preseason NFL game. Um, you know, you might be able to glean some important information, but it may not be obvious what that information is to everybody who's watching it at the same time. Uh, meaning, um, you know, this is one race in one state on, uh, on a date held uh, a few months before the actual midterm elections. Uh, there's a reason that it's looked at it as a bellwether in particular, the, uh, the New York um, the district in the uh, Hudson Valley, basically, um, with a, a Republican, Mark Molinaro, who's the chairman of one county, and the Democrat, Pat Ryan, who is the chairman 
of a nearby county. Uh, they are uh, running against each other. And one of the big issues here has been abortion. Uh, the Democrat, Pat Ryan, has really tried to angle the discussion toward that, uh, toward that Dobbs ruling and saying that the Supreme Court uh, made the wrong decision. Um, and so I think there are a lot of people who are looking at that race as a bellwether for that issue. What's interesting is um, because of redistricting and because we were in a, a year in which there is redistricting, this district actually isn't um, – <laughs> That, that they're fighting for tonight isn't the new district, but the old district. And both of these guys uh, are going to be on the ballot again in November. So um, it, it, they will get another bite at the apple, whatever happens. But this is a pretty closely competitive district right now. It means a little bit Democratic. Um, but we could see the loser tonight win uh, win in November um, and, and still come to Congress. Before I let you go, I should ask you about this uh, U.S. Senate race between Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen and former Oklahoma State House Speaker T.W. Shannon running for the seat of the outgoing Senator James Inhofe. What should we be watching there? Um, you know, this is uh, another test of Donald Trump in the primaries. He got behind Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen. Uh, T.W. Shannon is somebody who also sought, uh, you know, basically sought to fashion himself as a Trump-style Republican. They've been running as hard as they can uh, toward Trump, um, both, you know, as conservatives. Uh, but th this is a race where the winner of the primary is all but certain to win the general election. Oklahoma has an elected Democrat to the Senate in many, many years, basically, um, you know, since the time that uh, Jerry Nadler and, and Carolyn Maloney weren't in Congress. And as you can see, we're slowly beginning to get some results from this, but NBC News is still characterizing this race as too early to call. So don't read too much into those percentage points between Congressman Mullen and Mr. Shannon. We still need a lot more results before we can make a confident projection. Thank you, John. That's NBC's John Allen. And earlier we heard from NBC Shaquille Brewster in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Let's continue now with Democratic strategist Christina Carrica Haley and NBC News political analyst Carlos Curbelo. He's a former Republican congressman from Florida. Let me start with you, Christina, and this race in New York. Congressman Nadler spoke to NBC this morning about his role on the House Judiciary Committee. I'd like you to hear what he said, and then I'll ask you about it in a second. Listen. I believe this country is, is really, uh, the democratic system with a small d is threatened. And uh, we're in a pivotal position on the Judiciary Committee uh, to defend that, to defend against that threat uh, through voting rights legislation and uh, administration. And uh, also we have other threats that we have to face. Uh Christina, I try not to deal in a lot of hyperbole, but it's kind of hard to overstate how important this race will be to House Democrats. I mean, you've got two chair people of two very powerful committees who are now thrust into a race against one another. So this will be consequential. It'll be consequential. Some might argue that the consequences might be good, right? We have a party system within the Democrats when it comes to chairmanship that is all based on seniority. And if we're listening to kind of the overcry of voters, oftentimes they're saying we want new blood. And maybe that's the right thing and maybe not. Being somebody who worked for Senator in a way who, you know, represented the state of Hawaii um, upon its inception of becoming a state, I understand how it's important it is to have kind of a long standing uh, precedent setting person who understands what's going on and, and, and can guide the party. But at the same time, this might be an unusual way to kind of make both sides of the party happy, so to speak. We'll be getting some different folks in, but we'll also be keeping some of that veteran knowledge. Now, it's been really interesting to see two members who, again, as you said, are pillars of the party and both chair persons of committees that haven't had to really push turnout in a while. And being that their backgrounds are so similar, being that they've been stallmates in, in this party together and seeing how personal it's turned, it's been a very interesting race to watch. Consequential, as you said, it will be. It's been interesting to see that it kind of seems with the Schumer endorsement and the New York Times that Nadler seems to be the one to beat. Well, the polls will close at the top of the hour, and we'll have some characterizations on that race as soon as we can. Carlos, let me ask you about these races in Florida. I don't think Val Demings getting the Senate nomination is any real shock. She has enormous name recognition in Florida, so that projection, I think, makes sense. I wonder what your sense is, though, of the Nikki Freed-Charlie Crist race. I mean, 
other than the fact that Charlie Crist has so much name recognition, right? I remember covering him when he was governor back when I worked at the Miami Herald. What do you make of the race and, and its importance in terms of November and beyond? Well, Joshua, I think it gives you an idea of the mood of the uh, uh, Florida Democratic electorate. Charlie Crist made a very different argument than Nikki Fried. Charlie Crist told Florida Democrats that he is a candidate that could build a winning coalition in November. Obviously, with Democratic support, a lot of independent support, and perhaps support from some disaffected Republicans. Nikki Fried made a different argument. She said that what Democrats needed in Florida was for their base to be excited, to turn out in heavy numbers, and that she was the candidate that could do that. She sought to uh, pick up some of that momentum that Democrats uh, got uh, throughout the country after uh, the overturning of Roe versus Wade. But it seems that uh, tonight, Florida Democrats have made a pragmatic decision and have chosen the safe candidate who they think can build a winning coalition against a very strong incumbent in Ron DeSantis. Before I come back to you, Christina, Carlos, with regard to the pragmatic decision, I wonder what your sense is, granted, as a former Republican congressman, about Democratic political strategy in Florida. As, as a native, it feels like there's this tension between more moderate, pragmatic, let's say, Democrats, and more progressive Democrats who definitely have a constituency that wants the party to pull harder to the left and be more progressive, but they keep struggling in the polls, right? They, there's, there's energy there, but there's not as many victories as there are for more moderate Democrats. And I'm not sure what that means for the competitiveness of statewide Florida politics. Well, I think that's right, Joshua. Four years ago, the Democrat electorate here made a different choice. Andrew Gillum beat Gwen Graham. Gwen Graham ran a more centrist campaign. Gwen Graham made the argument that she'd be able to build a winning coalition throughout the state. Democrats chose Andrew Gillum. He came close. It was a very close race between him and Ron DeSantis, but ultimately he lost. So four years later, Democrats here in Florida have made the opposite decision. They have chosen a candidate who is a known quantity, who has a long history in the state, has a name in the state, and who might be able to put together the kind of coalition they need to win here for the first time in a very long time. Yeah, I'll be really interested to see how that coalition comes together or perhaps doesn't around Charlie Crist if he's able to pull Republicans who remember him as governor as well as Democrats who might want to change. We'll see how that works out. Christina, let me come back to you in a special House race here in New York between Democrat Pat Ryan and Republican Mark Molinaro. Both of them spoke to NBC's Dasha Burns today. Here's part of what they said. Watch. I think the foundations of our democracy are at threat. I mean, we have fundamental rights and freedoms, including the right for a woman to have access to safe abortion, to have reproductive rights being ripped away. And so much of this race has been about standing up and saying that is not who we are as Americans. What is this race about? Yeah, it's, it's about the voters and the voters are concerned. Residents, families, farmers are concerned about the price of gas, the price of eggs, the price of groceries. They know in this part of the state you've got to drive 25 miles to work and you're added new costs. Christina, I got to say, I'm I'm not a huge fan of the is this about abortion or is this about inflation dichotomy like voters can hold two thoughts in their heads at once. But I hear the difference in terms of what these candidates would like us to believe that these races are about. What do you think that this race is about? Well, I think um, not as inconsequential as, as your previous guest mentioned. I do think it's a little bit more uh, telling than an NFL pregame or a preseason game. But I do tend to agree that there has been a lot of weight placed on this race. And, and we have to remember it is August. There are still a lot of folks on vacation. There are a lot of things going on. Setting that aside, this is a very interesting district. Uh, the current lieutenant governor, who I will admit is a good friend of mine, who I've worked for in the past, um, you know, held this seat that I think people say leans blue and things like that, but I think that kind of undercuts the amount of work he did and, and, and the amount of different steps he took that maybe weren't aligned with the national party when he was in Congress. And that is how he held this seat. This seat is a true toss up. So I think it's a very interesting time to look at it. Whether, like you said, it's 
truly about just abortion or inflation. At the end of the day, inflation hits everyone, no matter what you think about any social issue, including abortion. So I'd argue that folks who are worried about abortion are also thinking with inflation on their minds when they're going to the voter box. So it'll be very interesting to see, I think more so, if this tactic of kind of the anti-national Republican message works, because they're really kind of pulling away. They're not standing behind um, a kind of more Trump-esque or far right, however we want to package that message um, here in, in New York 19, they're really trying to push the kind of everyday issues. However, voters in that district that I know not as well as, as some of the folks that worked on the district campaign of that, but that I know from working with the current lieutenant governor, truly do care about what he got done. And he got a lot of things done on the small business community, a lot of things done for farmers. And so therefore, if they're thinking of the past four years or so, they're going to see that a Democrat even though they have tough inflation, did a lot to pass law, or to help pass bipartisan bills in Congress to get them, you know, whether it was an easier time for their, you know, farming needs, et cetera. So I think it's going to be really interesting in that sense to see it. But I think what will be able, what either party will be able to do um, based on whoever wins is kind of have a bit of groundwork of how to run this. Obviously, Pat Ryan making this all about abortion is, is hoping to turn out what we've been hearing as this elusive suburban women's vote, right? Whether, right. Whatever we want to read into that is. Now, and when we have with the Republicans on the side is how far can you pull back in a swing district to make it seem like you are a bit more moderate? And I think that's kind of what's going to build the foundation to see how both parties move forward come midterm elections. As we mentioned, these guys are both going to be on the ballot no matter what when come November. So it's a very interesting race to watch. But I think it does kind of point to a few of the things that Carlos mentioned earlier as well, where are folks really kind of listening to the social issues? Is this abortion issue really going to turn out? Or are they really just fed up and trying something different? Right, and right. so I think it's just going to go from there. And I have to say, as a local Floridian, I am as or a, a born and raised Floridian, now local to D.C., I am as interested in all the other races that you all have been mentioning as well. For sure. For sure. There, oh, <laughs> we, come November, we will all be having these conversations and we will have... We, there are not enough hours in the night. We will have way too much to talk about. <laughs> hey, one more race I want to call before we have to pause. We've got another projection. NBC News can project in the Democratic primary for Oklahoma's U.S. Senate seat. We can project that Madison Horn will win that primary. She's a cybersecurity professional who describes herself as a conservative Democrat. She was running against Jason Bollinger, a former State Department employee who now is an attorney based in Oklahoma City. But NBC News can project that Madison Horn will prevail in the Democratic primary for U.S. Senate. Carlos Cubello and Christina Carrica Haley, good to have you both with us tonight. Thank you very much. We'll keep an eye on more projections as the night goes on, but stay with us after now tonight for our Meet the Press election special. Kristen Welker and Chuck Todd will have the latest projections and analysis that's at the top of the hour, 9 p.m. Eastern, here on NBC News Now. And remember, if you have to step away from your computer or whatever screen you're watching on, you can always get the latest results at NBCNews.com or the NBC News app. Still to come, the search of Mar-a-Lago. We're learning more about how many documents agents found there and how highly classified some of them were. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. A letter from the National Archives is shedding more light on the documents taken from Mar-a-Lago. It seems that former President Trump had a lot of highly sensitive material there, and that's before this month's FBI search. We first saw this letter on the website of conservative journalist John Solomon. It refers to 15 boxes of documents that Mr. Trump's lawyers turned over this January. According to the note, these documents include, included classified national security information. Some were marked top secret, containing sensitive, compartmented information and special access program materials. We'll explain what those classifications mean in just a second. This prompted the archives to get the Department of Justice and the FBI involved, and that eventually led to the search of Mar-a-Lago. According to the New York Times, multiple sources say the federal government has recovered more than 300 classified documents from there since Donald Trump left the presidency, first in January, then in June, and again last month. NBC News has yet to independently verify the Times report. 
let's bring in NBC Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian for more on this. Ken, what all do we know about the nature of the documents that are involved and the timeline of events between the beginning of the effort to get them back and what we saw at Mar-a-Lago? Well, Joshua, the letter published by the National Archives today sheds new light on the serious nature of the classified documents that were found in the batch that the Trump team turned over in January. We knew there were classified documents in those 15 boxes, but what we learned today is that some of those documents were marked Top Secret SCI, Sensitive Compartmented Information, and SAP, Special Access Programs. And, and that means some of the most classified documents in the U.S. government, the kind that only a small number of cleared individuals are allowed to see. And what that shows is that the government had reason very early on, early, as early as January of this year, to be very concerned about the nature of the documents that were squirreled away at Mar-a-Lago. And yet it wasn't until August, obviously, that they sought and executed a search warrant to go get what they view as the remainder of the documents. And then we also learned from, a, from the Trump lawsuit that in between that period of time, there was a series of steps, uh, grand jury subpoenas, visits by the Justice Department to Mar-a-Lago before they took the ultimate dramatic step of doing the search warrant, Joshua. So they really tried to exhaust a lot of other steps, it seems, before they went for the search warrant. They, they, although I, I kind of wonder about that because they knew that there was really sensitive information potentially in the president's possession. Do, do we have any sense of why the process took January to August as opposed to just going to Mar-a-Lago right away? That is a reasonable question that a lot of people are asking. When I ask my sources about that, um, they say that it suggests that the, the Justice Department was not concerned about an unauthorized disclosure, or at least didn't believe that there was an imminent unauthorized disclosure. In other words, the documents were there in Mar-a-Lago. There's Secret Service agents down there. It's not a secure facility, of course. I mean, my God, it's it's you know it's a beach club with, with lots of people going in and out. But they, the, it appears that there was not a, a concern that they needed to go right away and get those things because they were at risk of being exposed. They and, and it also feels like, Joshua, that they bent over backwards because they were dealing with a former president to exhaust every option before, again, they sent FBI agents armed with a court order to go take the stuff back. Yeah, a beach club in a flood zone on the town of Palm Beach, which could make storing secure documents somewhat challenging. So how does this fit into everything else that we're seeing in terms of the investigation and public knowledge of it? We're still waiting to hear from that federal judge about whether parts of the affidavit that led to the search can be released. Does this factor into that at all? I don't think so. I think we're going to see very little. The judge signaled in his written ruling that while he is, he did open open the door to releasing some part of this document. You know, he agrees with the Justice Department that the bulk of it is too sensitive to make public, and so it's going to be heavily redacted. If we see anything at all, it probably isn't going to be very consequential. I really think the next steps in this whole saga are, are we we know, we can see that the FBI is is still investigating the question of why this information was there, who, and who got it there, and what were the consequences of it, and was there any unauthorized disclosure of this information? It's bad enough that it was there. It was illegal that it was kept there, according to the Justice Department's theory of the case, but then the, the next question is, was it disclosed to somebody who's didn't, you know, who shouldn't have seen it, a foreign power or somebody else? And, and you know, it, it's clear from the court documents that they are still interviewing witnesses and gathering information in pursuit of the answers to those questions, Joshua. And can we just be clear, Ken, I know we've covered this before in our conversations on this, but I, I think it's worth hitting again in terms of the nature of these documents and why they're there and the president's contention and his lawyer's contention that he is a president, he has the power to declassify anything that he sees fit, and that that kind of plenary declassification power is something that should be factored in, that should be given latitude in terms of how the Justice Department proceeds with this. What does the law say in terms of what President Trump can do as president and then after he's left office? 
Yeah, so that document, has, I mean, that, that argument by the Trump side has just been uh, utterly refuted by every legal expert on this, on this count because there are two issues here. One, the president uh, does have declassification authority, but um, the, the ex-president doesn't, and there appears to be no record that the documents at Mar-a-Lago were declassified. So there's a real question about whether he ever declassified them. If he did, there would have to be some kind of memorialization of that. But secondly, as we talked about before, the statutes at issue here don't require that the documents be classified. Leaving aside the issue of whether they were secret and sensitive, they were the property of the U.S. government. That's what the archives makes very clear in their letter published today. And in fact, when Trump tried to assert executive privilege on them, uh, President Biden, who holds that privilege, instructed the archives that it was up to them whether they saw a privilege, and they said, sorry, we don't see an executive privilege. They said, these are the American public's documents, and we want them back. So it's just not a legal argument. Uh, that, that benefits Trump at all to assert that you know he declassified this stuff because then the question is well why did you have them anyway there weren't they weren't your documents they should have been at the archives as every other uh, former president has done with their own documents all right thank you Ken that's NBC Justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney you bet we will get to some of today's other top stories in a moment, including the White House's plan to forgive some student loans, a verdict for the men who plotted to kidnap Michigan's governor, and a growing number of companies scaling back paternity benefits. Another projection in tonight's primaries, NBC News can project that Florida Republican Congressman Matt Gates will prevail in his primary race for re-election. He represents a district up in Pensacola, Eglin Air Force Base in the Florida Panhandle, a very conservative part of the state running against Mark Lombardo. You may recall he has been in the headlines for an array of reasons, including an investigation of sex trafficking. There have been some federal investigations regarding whether Congressman Gates and an associate used the internet to find women they could pay for sex. He has not been charged with a crime. He has denied all of the accusations. But again, none of that seemed to have impacted his ability to run for re-election in his district in the first congressional district in Florida. Matt Gates, we can project, will win his primary tonight. We'll let you know if we have any more projections and races. And of course, we'll have full coverage of tonight's races at the top of the hour. Let's continue our headlines at the White House with some help paying off our student loans. Sources tell us that President Biden is expected to cancel $10,000 in federal loans per borrower. That's federal loans, not private. The president could make the announcement tomorrow. This plan would apply to borrowers who earn up to $125,000 a year. Federal student loan payments have been on pause since the pandemic began back in March of 2020. That pause is set to expire at the end of the month, but President Biden is also expected to extend it further. The State Department is still urging Americans to leave Ukraine. It now says there's a growing threat of Russian strikes on infrastructure and government buildings. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says that if that happened, his country would answer quickly with a, quote, strong response. Tomorrow, the country celebrates its Independence Day. That could be when the Biden administration announces the largest aid package for Ukraine so far. It contains around $3 billion of weapons and equipment. Meanwhile, the situation at Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear power plant remains alarming. Ukraine says that Russian shelling has damaged the plant's infrastructure and chemical facilities. The International Atomic Energy Agency says its inspectors are trying to get there. NBC's Josh Letterman has more from Kyiv. Hey, Josh. Joshua, as Ukraine prepares to celebrate its Independence Day tomorrow, the U.S. State Department is warning that Russia is planning to step up its attacks on government facilities as well as civilian infrastructure in the country. State Department spokesman Ned Price saying the information the U.S. has received is tied to the celebration tomorrow of Independence Day as well as the six-month anniversary of the war starting, with Russia potentially using those occasions as an excuse to bombard Ukraine, which 
which is one reason President Zelensky is urging caution. We have seen more troops here on the streets of Kyiv uh, patrolling tonight. Uh, and the second largest city in the country, Kharkiv, is planning to impose a round-the-clock curfew to try to keep people safe. And in the meantime, there are new concerns at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, with the state-run energy company saying that one of the workers at that plant, a mechanic, was killed by shelling that hit his taxi cab, and that other shelling over the last few days has hit chemical and laboratory facilities at the nuclear plant, as well as damaging a nearby thermal fossil fuel plant that is needed to keep the nuclear plant operating safely. The IAEA saying that it is important to get inspectors on the ground from the United Nations as soon as possible. They are in negotiations with Russia and Ukraine, and if they're successful, they hope to be able to have inspectors here in the next few days. Joshua? Hopefully. Yeah, thank you, Josh. That was NBC's Josh Letterman reporting from Kyiv. Two men now face prison time for plotting to abduct Michigan's governor, Gretchen Whitmer. Today, a federal jury convicted Adam Fox and Barry Croft Jr. This is the second trial for these men. The first one ended in a mistrial. Prosecutors say the pair planned on taking the Democratic governor from her vacation home back in 2020. The plan called for blowing up a bridge in the getaway. Undercover agents were there as they scouted the area. They were found guilty of conspiring to obtain a weapon of mass destruction. Prosecutors also argued the kidnapping was part of a larger plan to incite a second civil war. A statement from Governor Whitmer reads in part, quote, Today's verdicts prove that violence and threats have no place in our politics, and those who seek to divide us will be held accountable. They will not succeed, unquote. The two men face up to life in prison. Some companies are offering incredible perks to get top talent. Others are scaling back. One of the areas being curtailed, parental leave benefits. The Society for Human Resource Management surveyed 3,000 employers. Back in 2020, 53% of employers said they offered paid maternity leave beyond what is legally required. Today, only 35% of employers say they do. And that is forcing some new parents to rethink their plans. NBC's Hallie Jackson has the story. It's about becoming a father. I've always wanted to be a dad, but as things are right now, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. He's a Texas-based customer service rep Did with Hulu, a reader? streaming service owned by the Walt Disney Company. He tells NBC Hulu recently cut its fully paid parental leave benefits from 20 weeks down to eight weeks. For a company like Disney to, to really pull back on something uh, like 20 weeks is, is just kind of crazy. Hulu declined to comment, but it comes as many companies are now cutting paid parental leave. 35% of employers now offer paid maternity leave beyond what's required by law, but that's down from 53% in 2020, according to a new survey by the Society for Human Resource Management. Paternity leave fell from 44% in 2020 to 27% in 2022 also. I really was surprised at the result. It almost was a little counterintuitive. We're in the middle of a war for talent, and we know that employees value this benefit. So a lot of companies have said, we're going to hunker down. We're going to take some proactive steps to reduce our expense line so that we can successfully not only survive, but thrive on the other side of whatever economic recession were to take place. Only 11 states and Washington, D.C. have laws that require most employers to offer some paid leave to new parents. The other 39 states do not. U.S. federal law lets qualifying workers take up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave after their child is born, but not getting paid is just not feasible for many employees. I honestly don't want to be in a situation where I'm going to have to make a decision between, you know, having a kid or being able to eat next week. The amount of companies offering parental leave benefits over the past 15 years has mostly increased with a drop during the 2008 and 2009 economic crisis. In fact, the SHRM study shows that compared to 2007, nearly twice as many companies surveyed offered paid maternity leave. But during the pandemic, that was almost tripled. You have employees that have been in a very powerful position with lots of options in terms of their work and their priorities have shifted. And then you have many employers who are now wanting to transition back toward pre-pandemic systems and costs and benefits. And there's going to be a tug of war that's gonna shake out and we're gonna be watching that happen. 
But for some workers who may be finding their leave cut back, finding a company with competitive leave benefits is top of mind. Companies really need to start appreciating their workers more because they're going to start losing a lot of hardworking people over things like this. That was NBC's Hallie Jackson reporting. Remember, you can catch Hallie weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern here on NBC News Now. Up next, a whistleblower from Twitter. A former executive there is accusing the social network of being dangerously careless with its security. That's just ahead. Stay close. Got another call to make. There are two U.S. Senate races in Oklahoma, and the Republican primary for one of those races we can now call confidently. NBC News is projecting that Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen will prevail in that race over former Oklahoma State House Speaker T.W. Shannon. This is the race to succeed Senator James Inhofe, who is going to retire at the end of this year. So this is the race to finish his term. The other race I mentioned earlier, the Democratic primary between Madison Horn and Jason Bollinger, that is to go against Jim Lankford at the end of this year for a full term. Two different Oklahoma Senate races, but for the special election, we can project that Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen will prevail in that race. I know it all gets a little bit complicated. We will have continuing coverage of that and all the other races at the top of the hour. Elon Musk and Twitter are still battling it out over the billionaire backing out of his takeover. Today, the social media platform has a new critic, a whistleblower who knows the company from the inside. The complaint comes from Twitter's former security chief, Peter Zatko. He filed it with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the U.S. Department of Justice, and the Federal Trade Commission. Mr. Zatko claims that the company misled the government and the public about its security. He says that Twitter cannot adequately protect its 238 million daily users, including heads of state. In response, Twitter says it fired Mr. Zatko this year. A statement from the company reads in part, quote, what we've seen so far is a false narrative about Twitter and our privacy and data security practices that is riddled with inconsistencies and inaccuracies and lacks important context, unquote. NBC technology correspondent Jake Ward joins us now. Jake, first of all, tell us a little bit more about Peter Zatko himself. He's a hacker who's known as Mudge in hacker circles. And from what I gather, he has a really strong reputation. That's absolutely right, Joshua. This is an extremely esteemed uh, sort of old guard hacker, if you can call him that. Uh, you know, as early as the 1990s, there are these extraordinary public photos of him being one of the first cybersecurity experts to show up in front of a congressional subcommittee to talk about the threat of cybersecurity. And in front of him, the little placard reads Mudge, which is, of course, his hacker name. He's, by the way, sitting next to a guy on the one hand uh, called Kingpin, another guy called Space Rogue. It's one of my favorite photos of today. But the amazing thing about this guy is just how well regarded he is in all circles, academic, cybersecurity, everybody. I spoke to people who've worked with him or alongside him, uh, have just known about him and say that he is truly an unimpeachable character. He was hired, of course, by Jack Dorsey at a time when Twitter was uh, really in gr a great deal of, of public scrutiny, real trouble when it came to hacking. In 2020, you'll recall, a group of teenagers managed to get inside the most sensitive systems of the company and begin impersonating people like Jeff Bezos. Barack Obama and ask through their accounts for people to send uh, to buy cryptocurrency. It was a ridiculous scam, but really highlighted some big vulnerabilities inside that company. Peter Zatko was hired in to be the head of security and embarked on what he describes as a real sort of mad dash, a scramble to try to get together a company that he says was full of vulnerabilities, Joshua. The nature of the vulnerabilities, Jake, is something that I was kind of surprised by. Like, it, it sounds like from what he's saying, there were too many people, in his view, who had access to the core controls that make Twitter run. This would be akin to having, the co as he described it, the cockpit of an airplane accessible by everyone from the pilots to the flight attendants to the baggage handlers who throw your luggage toward baggage claim that everybody could get in and out and put their hands on the guts of Twitter. 
Yes, and the reason that we're so concerned about this in theory, if the complaint it bears out, is that if 50% of that company really does have access to really everything in the, inside the, the database, and that includes things like geolocation data, your personal cell number, your possibly your physical address, certainly uh, your email address, you know, all kinds of bad things can result from that. And, you know, that may explain in part why that big 2020 hack was possible. Those teenagers essentially called people up inside the company and trick them into handing over their passwords. That's a level of access, 50% of an 11,000 person company having that kind of access. That's pretty unheard of in these kinds of circles. And just to you know, quickly rattle off a few of the other accusations he makes here in the complaint, because they are really big ones. He says, for instance, that uh, not only is there this sort of unbridled access to, to half of the, of the employees of the company, he also says that there's really no internal mechanism for rooting out bad actors. And that may explain in part why a former Twitter manager was just convicted two weeks ago of being a Saudi agent. He also claims in the complaint that uh, two people were hired uh, directly as agents of the Indian government at the request of that government. Another thing that, you know, really uh, shocks uh, privacy experts. And then, of course, the big thing here, you know, you mentioned Elon Musk, and that is a big thing. But the other really big one is a violation of the consent decree that the FTC placed on Twitter at, in 2011 yeah. after privacy violations were found. Twitter had paid off about $150 million in, in fines at that point. Suppose he was making good on that. This blows all of that apart because over and over again in the complaint, he basically alleges that the that Twitter is not living up to its requirements under the consent decree. So you know the FTC is going to be looking into this. Yeah, I will be interested to see how the FTC handles this and then how Congress eventually handles this. Hackers in Congress operate very, very differently. So I'm not sure exactly how all of this shakes out, but the accusations are certainly damning. We'll see where it goes. Thank you, Jake. That's NBC tech correspondent Jake War talking us through the latest controversy at Twitter. Some high school students will take a new advanced placement class this fall in African American studies. One of the course's instructors joins us before we go. When I went to college, I skipped three classes, English, Spanish, and history. That's because I got good scores on those advanced placement exams in high school, and they counted for college credit. AP classes can exempt high schoolers from a number of college course requirements, and now that list includes a course I ended up taking in college anyway, African American Studies. The College Board, which administers AP courses, is piloting the class this fall. It's the first new AP course in eight years. Joining us now is Marlon Williams Clark. He is teaching a pilot course of AP African American Studies at the Florida State University Schools. Welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Give me an example of some of the things that students will be learning in an African American AP Studies class. Well, it's a very uh, comprehensive history of the African American experience. So the types of things that they will be learning um, ranges from starting on the continent of Africa and getting an understanding of where it all begins, but they will also look at, um, you know, our histories within the United States and, you know, having an understanding that African-American history does not start at 1619. Um, it starts in the motherland, as I call it. And they'll be able to look at a, a range of materials that give a comprehensive story of the African-American experience, whether it be literature, uh, whether it be movies, whether it be music, um, but just a whole, a whole lot of things that honestly, I really didn't get to explore seriously until college. And so now um, they'll have this opportunity to do it in high school and there's a thirst for it. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of this. I believe school's been in session for y'all for a few weeks now. How have students responded to the course so far? Well, um, it's interesting you asked that. Tonight I just had open house. And so sometimes I can't really gauge if they're really connecting with the class. But I've heard over and over again tonight from parents how much the students are loving the class. They're loving the discussions. They're loving um, the materials that are being put in front of them. So. Um, we're having a good time um, it, with it being um, an elective social studies course. Um, it, you have students that really want to be there. And so it's not like 
your history class that you're required to take for a graduation. It is something that you want to take and they are really just diving all in. There's been a lot of controversy in the state of Florida over the years about the teaching of African-American history. I remember when I was a kid being part of the Palm Beach County effort to integrate African-American history throughout the curriculum. Remember that very vividly. But more recently, you've had the Stop Woke Act, which a judge recently blocked, which regulates the teaching of, of race in schools and how it's taught in some businesses. The state of Florida has already banned the teaching of critical race theory, which, to be clear, there is zero evidence that any grade school in Florida teaches CRT. How do you deal with that controversy, if it's come up at all, in terms of being able to teach this subject? Well, I think, um, first, well, first of all, Florida has, has had the course code for African-American history um, for years now, and there are African-American history standards um, within uh, the, the Florida state standards. Um, but we have to focus on teaching the standards and teaching the students from a sense of learning to analyze primary and secondary sources. I'm not here to give them my opinion. And of course, they want to know, you know, with you being a teacher in front of them, um, they want to know your opinion, but that's, that's not my job. My job is to present the information to them, um, so that they can make a, um, a decision for themselves. Um, and I think that when you do go and look at primary sources, especially primary sources, because that is the most uh, true story that you can tell of, of an experience by getting it from someone who was living at that time. When you put the primary sources in front of them, they understand, um, they get a sense of what it actually was as opposed to how history has been told after the fact, whether it was a retelling um, or leaving information out. And as we know, um, in K-12 schools across the country, I think you could survey any adult in this country right. um, who cared anything about African-American history and they would say, I wish I learned more or we didn't talk much about it. And so um, this kind of course fills in the blanks of what is left out of your uh, mainstream U.S. history uh, storytelling. It invites the story of African Americans and not just talk about the trauma um, and the negatives. You know, a lot of people, they want to look at slavery and then the civil rights movement and then Barack Obama was the first black president. Right, right, right. But in this sense, they'll be able to um, see the positives, everything that African-Americans have been able to achieve and yeah. uh, contribute to the United States history in spite of their conditions at the time. Marlon Williams-Clark, an instructor with the Florida State University Schools. Appreciate you coming on tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. By the way, I wonder how many of those faces you could identify. It's Langston Hughes, Thurgood Marshall. How many more could you name? Just wondering. We always appreciate you making time for us. Send us your thoughts and questions on anything we discussed tonight. We're at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email us now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. I'll see you tomorrow, but sit tight. The Meet the Press election special is next on NBC News Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.